It's my great pleasure to introduce Romas Gelejunas from uh, Gilead Sciences. Um, Romas is the director of clinical virology department of Gilead, and he's also heading a new initiative at, um, at Gilead that is aimed at uh, HIV advanced therapies. And it's my great pleasure to have him here talk not only because he's a great scientist, but also we, um, we did actually our postdoc together at Gladstone, and so it's a, a distinct pleasure to have him here. Romas. Thank you, Melanie. Um, pleasure to be here, to uh, spend some time with the, uh, the Bay Area virology community. Thanks for the organizers for inviting me. This is a, a special privilege. I'm very happy to be here. So um, what I'll do today is I'll uh, tell you about the HIV eradication program that we uh, are conducting at, uh, at Gilead. And this has been going on for, for quite a while, about five years now. And uh, it's a very exciting program. And um, as a segue, you know, I was telling you how excited I am about working at this company, Gilead. And one of the reasons is we have the ability to do these, these types of things. Obviously, we are well known for our small molecule antivirals, but we were also one of the first companies in this HIV eradication space, and we're actually realistically coming, with to, coming up with some, some strategies here that I think are, are very reasonable and, and should be pursued. And, and obviously, this is endorsed at the highest levels at the company, so it's a very, very exciting time for us. As you can imagine, uh, it's unlikely that one drug will cure AIDS, so that's, that's why we're already thinking of concepts of combination therapy. And you'll see why uh, very shortly. All right, so the issue that we have in industry, or the way we approach problems in industry, is we like to think of targets, a receptor, an enzyme, et cetera, and we basically devise assays around the target. So for example, reverse transcriptase in HIV, right? The enzyme that transforms the RNA into DNA, but an enzyme, we can crystallize it, you can set up screens, you can identify small molecules, inhibitors of these enzymes, and then you basically translate that, you optimize them, you bring them to the clinic. So you have a concrete target, it's very linear. This problem is very, very different. It's quite daunting because the target is a bit nebulous. So what happens, and just to quickly take you through this introductory material, so when a patient is, uh, presents, a uh, patient has viral loads, this is the y-axis, uh, plasma viral loads, and the patient is viremic. We basically um, put them on antiviral therapy, and this rapidly leads to a reduction in the plasma viral load to below 50 copies per ml, and patients are generally well controlled at that level. Their virus does not evolve, and, and they do well. Now, if you, uh, if you stop antiretroviral treatment in these patients, you have a, a pretty rapid viral rebound. And in essence, this is the problem. Where is this rebound coming from? So people treated for many, many, many years do not get cured of HIV with antiretrovirals. They have a reservoir that's established. And this reservoir is the target. If we understood this reservoir full well, we could uh, do something to eradicate it. So here's what we know. So in this period of viral persistence, there is, is residual viremia that, that basically is present. And you can see this with ultra-sensitive methods, you know, qPCR assays, single copy assays. And what you find is that there is this residual viremia, and what we know is that there is, in this population of cells, these resting memory CD4 positive T cells that harbor latent HIV. We know them because virtually everybody who has looked for these cells, you can isolate them from the periphery of a patient, you put them in culture, you treat them with mitogens, et cetera, you can bring out HIV. So we know they exist. So that presents a target. But there's things that we don't fully understand. So for example, we know that this residual viremia, not all of that virus is coming from these latently infected cells. There are other cells that we can't readily isolate that are also contributing to this residual viremia, and that poses a problem. We can't readily isolate them, we can't study them, we can't figure out what they're about. So, so this is essentially why most of the field has focused on, on this particular reservoir the latent reservoir, which is replication-competent HIV that is carried in these memory CD4 positive T cells, and these cells have a very long half-life. So this is one of the issues that we're trying to address. We're trying to basically eliminate this reservoir, and then we'll go on most likely to other reservoirs, but this is the one that we have the ability to study now. 
So how, how does one go about trying to eliminate uh, this latent reservoir of HIV? So as I said, it's latent. So the first thing you need to do is you need to find a safe modality to activate this latent virus to have it make particles. Otherwise, you can't target these cells by an intervention, or the immune system can't see the, these cells. So you have to basically have them express. And when they, begun, when they begin to express virions, then suddenly you have a marker on these cells, and you can start imagining strategies. For example, antibody drug conjugates. So an antibody that targets the HIV envelope that's expressed on the surface, conjugated to a toxic cargo, perhaps that would work. And then obviously, if you have the ability to uh, uh, have these cells expressed, you have now the ability to also recruit the immune system to these cells, and these will potentially be recognized. And how can you now harness the power of the immune system to basically eliminate these cells? Obviously, the goal is to destroy, eliminate this reservoir. And this strategy would be done under the cover of complete antiretroviral therapy to make sure that when we release virions, you're not spreading and reseeding new reservoirs. Okay? So that's essentially the concept that we're, we're trying to find combination therapies around. So specifically, what have we done at Gilead in this space? So we have been working on strategies to activate HIV, to kill cells, and obviously the idea of combining these strategies is very much on our thoughts. So in terms of activating HIV expression from these latent cells, we've spent a, a great deal of time uh, studying inhibitors of histone deacetylases. And I'll tell you that story. It's kind of, kind of becoming quite interesting at this point. We've studied activators of protein kinase C. Uh, these are robust activators of latent HIV, but these, this class of compound, at least the ones that are available right now, are very, very toxic. The therapeutic indices are very, very narrow, so we don't see a currently a path forward for this class. We've done a lot of high-throughput screening, as you can imagine. We have some intriguing hits, and they're being studied right now. Too early to discuss uh, publicly at this point. In terms of eliminating actively uh, producing cells, we have uh, gained a, a quite a bit of interest in therapeutic vaccines, and I'll tell you about one of them today. This is quite exciting to us, these, these, the advent of these new, broadly neutralizing, highly potent antibodies, which could potentially be used to, via effector mechanisms, by specific antibodies and antibody drug conjugates. I'll tell you about our TLR7 agonist, an immune modulator, which we think might be able to fit into, into this scheme. All right, let's begin with HDAC inhibitors. So th this is uh, or a very brief uh, uh, introduction to histone deacetylases. First and foremost, what these enzymes do is they remove these chemical moieties called acetyl groups, and that's depicted here. And what they do is basically uh, these enzymes uh, cause uh, suppression of transcription, if you will, and uh, you can basically intervene uh, here in, the, in this particular cascade of events by blocking these HDAC enzymes with inhibitors, which will then favor the histone acetyl transferases. This leads to a uh, a relaxed chromatin that favors transcription. So, so the idea here is you temporarily block the HDAC enzyme, which causes a state of, of, uh, that is favorable to transcription. So the, these enzymes act on histones, tubulin, and transcription factors. And the connection to HIV is that these enzymes have been shown by many laboratories, including Eric Burden's lab, uh, to suppress gene expression, including HIV. So, Inhibitors of HDACs, and again, there's very good consensus in the field, they activate latent HIV. And this has been seen by virtually everybody who has looked at these uh, inhibitors in a variety of cell systems. Now, where this gets very interesting is that there are a couple of HDAC inhibitors that are already FDA approved for cutaneous T cell lymphoma, other lymphomas, and others are in development. So you can translate rapidly from the bench to the clinic. And, and that is very important because in these early days, you look for traction. You're trying to look for direction. What might be working? What might be helping uh, this cause? And specifically in this area, what can safely activate latent HIV in a human being without harming them? So three HDAC inhibitors uh, that have been the subject of clinical studies. One is varinostat or Saha, structure depicted here. Panobinostat is made by Novartis. And romadepsin is a cell gene drug. Both varinostat and romadepsin are already approved for human use, again, in these lymphomas. Panobinostat is a phase three compound. 
So these, uh, or Vernistat, was uh, the subject of a couple of clinical studies, one done in the United States and one in Australia by David Margolis and Sharon Lewin. And they both showed what we uh, were hoping to see, which was an increase in HIV expression in the cells, the CD4 cells of patients that have been dosed with one or several doses uh, of this drug. Similarly, uh, a study was conducted in Denmark by Rasmussen and Tolstrup, and uh, these guys and their team basically showed some evidence that uh, this drug, panobinostat, may have caused increases in HIV RNA in plasma. What I'm going to tell you more about today is the story of Roma Depson, and this is now the subject of an ACTG. This is the AIDS Clinical Trials Group, A5315 study, and a, and a study that was recently conducted by a small uh, group in, in, in Denmark, as well uh, in collaboration with the company Bionor, which is based in Norway, they uh, also conducted a study. And in this study, they have shown, uh, or at least described in a press release at this point, the data will actually be presented at the International AIDS Society meeting uh, later in the summer. But in the press release, they describe data suggesting that they did see viral blips. So this is a very, potentially a very important moment for us because it now suggests that these types of compounds may have the ability to activate in patients. So let me tell you a little bit about these, these HDAC inhibitors. So they're not, they're not exactly all the same. So these are the types of experiments that we have been conducting for many years now. We uh, isolate memory CD4 T cells from art-suppressed subjects, so not a cell system, not cell lines, and not primary cell systems, but actual patients from cells. We find that these are uh, most accurate at uh, reproducing uh, what we think are uh, inhib or activating events in, in patients. So what we do also is, um, is we basically use conditions that carefully mimic clinical dosing. And this is very important, uh, we think. So basically what we have done is we've taken romadepsin, which is a four-hour IV infusion at concentrations that are actually achieved in humans that have been dosed with this drug. So 40 nanomolar for four hours. Saha is exposed uh, or is used at one micromolar for 24 hours and panobinostat at 25 nanomolar. So as you can see, if you look at cell-associated viral RNA, we see what everybody has seen, that these HDAC inhibitors induce rapidly HIV RNA. In the case of romadepsin, uh, sustained expression, 6 to 48 hours. In the case of Saha and panobinostat, they're more transient, the effect. Come up quickly at 6 hours, down by 48. And this nicely correlates with the ability of these inhibitors to inhibit cellular HDAC activity. So the, the effect of romadepsin more sustained, and this correlates with the viral induction effect, and these are, are transient. So this was our first insight that perhaps mechanistically these events are linked, that the inhibitor, H, the HDAC inhibitor basically acting on the cellular enzyme somehow is connected to the induction of HIV. And we do these experiments because these are rare events. This is, these cells are, occur at a frequency of about one in a million in these patients. They're, they're very, very rare events. You have to use very sensitive and highly, highly sensitive methods to basically measure these viral RNAs. And this is where the field has been for quite a while. But then this question came up. Well, this is all very nice. We're inducing RNA in the cells of these patients. This is great. But is this HDAC mediated activation of HIV, is this leading to protein production? Because if it's not, then this is not going to take, take us to where we need to be. We need to remember, we have to expose envelope on these cells to be able to use interventions that will target these or have these cells now be visible to the immune system. So we have to put proteins uh, on, or the proteins have to be induced in these cells. So uh, this, again, is not an easy task because of, of the rare numbers of cells, but this is one way to get to this. So we, we basically modified the assay that I just told you about, again, using memory cells, memory T cells from art-suppressed subjects. We do, again, mimicking dosing in the clinic, so pulse treatments at concentrations that are relevant. And what we do here is we measure RNA, HIV RNA, and culture supernatants. So we're basically asking ourselves, are we actually causing the release of virions? And as you can see, the drug romadepsin at 5 and 40 nanomolar does seem to do this, but Saha doesn't. Okay, this is potentially a very important result. And what we also know is if you take these supernatants, you can pellet them at high speed, again, consistent with the formation of a virion. Now remember, I mentioned in the Saha trials that cell-associated RNA was induced, but the investigators never saw RNA in the plasma. So we're wondering at this point whether these assays and these analytical methods might have the ability to predict what might be able to release in vivo or particles in vivo. So to summarize very quickly this, this section, so the three drugs that have been taken to the clinic, again, from bench to clinic very quickly, were verinostat, panobinostat, and romadepsin. Verinostat has low potency to activate 
uh, HIV, panobinostatin, romadepsin have higher potency. Now, I haven't shown this data, but this is also very important. If you look at the human exposure or the, the, uh, the concentration that these drugs reach in people that are dosed with these drugs, in the case of varinostat, it's only about 10% of what is needed to activate HIV. In the case of panobinostat and romadepsin, the concentrations are in excess of what is needed to activate HIV. We think this is important. So you have to have potency, and your drug must reach levels that might be able to activate in vivo. So this, this could be crucial. Again, these are early days, but these could be crucial parameters to be looking at. Now, in terms of ex vivo activation, I told you that almost everybody, including us, saw cell-associated RNA, but if you do the more rigorous assessment of looking at HIV RNA in supernatants, we don't see that with varinostat. We haven't looked with panobinostat hard enough. We definitely see it with romadepsin. And this is the key connection here. Now, in vivo HIV activation in plasma, not been seen with, with uh, varinostat, maybe there are some signals in, in plasma with these other drugs. So this is a crucial pivotal moment, right? We need to make sure that the assays that we have developed and the methods that we have developed have the ability to predict what might be uh, activating in vivo. And if we have that, we'll be more efficient at driving compounds from the bench or the laboratory to, to the clinic. So that is essentially where we stand in terms of virus-inducing agents, or what we call latency reversal agents. We find that romadepsin might be the, uh, the preferred agent at this point, showing maybe some activity in vivo. Certainly our in vitro studies had uh, suggested that this was one of the more potent ones. So now if you ask what can we do to start to kill the cells that become able to express these virions, we think of therapeutic vaccination. But unfortunately, this has not been very successful in our field. So, so in speaking with a lot of the experts in the field, we ask ourselves why. Why has this not worked, and what can we do to improve this? So one concept is this, that when you use a therapeutic vaccine, and specifically in the area of HIV, when we think of this, we think of vaccines that induce robust CD8 cytotoxic T lymphocytes. All right? so, one possibility is that these vaccine responses wane before all these latently infected cells have expressed viral protein, right? The only way you can see this uh, phenomenon is possibly through, uh, through stochastic mechanisms like, uh, you know, proliferation of, of, of cells uh, or renewal of, of CD4 T cells, perhaps antigen stimulation. If you have to count on that and your response, your vaccine response has waned, well, obviously you're not synchronized. So how do you basically go about addressing that? Well, you would... For example, consider combining a vaccine, a robust vaccine, with agents that activate latent HIV. So here's your first concept, right? You can now time this. You can basically administer an HDAG inhibitor at the time of a peak CD8 response induced by a vaccine, and now you've coordinated the two events. You're flushing out virus at the time of a CD8 response. Could that work? There are studies that are ongoing around the world to try to address that. The other trick is you could potentially induce a persistent CD8 response, and I'll tell you today about some very exciting work that has been done by Lewis Picker using CMV vectors. Now, the other possibility is that the vaccines that are eliciting the CD8 CTL responses prime existing responses, but we have viruses that have escaped. You know, this virus is very good, HIV, at escaping CD8 responses. We know this. There are plenty of CTL escape mutants that have been documented. In fact, recent work by Bob Silicano shows that the reservoir is populated with these. So your vaccine response is not aligned with the reservoir. How do you, how do you address that? Well, again, if you had the means to prime de novo CD8 responses or increase the breadth of a CD8 response, maybe you have a chance at doing something. So here we think again of the CMV vectored approach as well as some work that is done by our close colleague Dan Baruch using mosaic antigens. The other way potentially of addressing this is to bypass MHC peptide presentation altogether using these intriguing bispecific antibodies, and I'll, I'll speak about that a little later. Finally, we have this intriguing series of observations by several groups which have shown that CD8 CTL, cytotoxic T lymphocytes, are excluded from germinal centers which contain HIV-positive T follicular helper cells. Well, that's a problem. If your CD8 cannot go find these cells that harbor some, a, a potential reservoir, how, how do you get around that? So here we think of perhaps maybe monoclonal antibody-based strategies. Specifically, maybe phagocytes can help us here. Probably not NK cells, but phagocytes, the antibody drug conjugate, maybe the bispecific, and now bring in those CD8s that you need. Finally, you heard about this today uh, in other areas, but including HIV, we have exhaustion of CD8 cells. And how do you address that? Well, there's a lot of action, a lot of action in the area of, of PD-1, PD-L1 
immune checkpoint blockers. So, so this is an area of, of high interest that we have to keep an eye on. So as you can imagine, uh, you have reservoirs that we don't understand, a few that we understand. It's highly likely that we're going to need a combination of these strategies to basically arrive at, at a depletion of, a substantial depletion of, of these, uh, these reservoirs that exist during therapy. So now let me tell you about this, this very intriguing vaccine that, um, that Lewis Picker is working on. So this is a CMV-based vector, right? So it's cytomegalovirus, large herpes virus. And what Lewis has discovered is if you basically drop into these CMV vectors, SIV antigens, and you vaccinate monkeys, you get quite a remarkable result. So here is the control arm of the study. This is uh, the usual DNA adenovirus type 5 prime boost strategy that has been used uh, thoroughly in the field. Uh, these are not persistent vectors. And what you see at best is no protection. These, this is viral load, basically, in the monkeys. You don't see protection. You don't block acquisition of infection. But at best, you may drop the set point a little bit. Yeah. What the, v, the CMV vector does, which is very distinct, is it does not block infection, per se. As you can see, the animals become viremic, actually quite high levels. But 50% of them acquire the, or have the ability to basically control and eventually uh, suppress uh, this, this SIV virus. Now, when Lewis looked carefully at what was left after three years, he could not recover any virus after three years. So this is our first example, I think, that we have the ability to program an immune system to basically control and potentially eradicate a, an aggressive AIDS virus. Now, this is done under prophylactic conditions, so we'll, we'll address the therapy in a, in a few seconds. So what characterizes this vaccine that is so unique and is distinct from all the other ones that preceded it is that it induces a broad, very high frequency and durable effector memory CD8 response. And in terms of breath, you have to look at this slide. This is from one of Lewis's recent papers. So now this is looking at the, uh, the CD8 responses, and these are the various epitopes that cover the gag gene specifically. This is the CMV vectored vaccine animals. These are elite controller monkeys, and these are the other types of vaccines, DNAs and, and proteins. As you can see, this vaccine elicits a tremendously broad response. And it's, it's also, what's very interesting about this is it also induces a class two restricted CD8 response. So I look forward to hearing from the immunologists in the crowd if there are any, what they think about this. Fascinating discovery by Lewis. Bottom line for us, in terms of therapeutic vaccine, this is definitely where you want to be, right? You want a broad response because, as I said, CD8, CTL mutants populate these reservoirs. If you have this kind of an immune response, you might have a chance of, of contributing to the reduction of the reservoir. So uh, this basically are the papers that Lewis has published recently on this question. Uh, the, the data are summarized here. But what I want to tell you about is, is actually unique activities that are occurring. And this basically, uh, I think, addresses how daunting this scientific problem is of HIV eradication. You have these very interesting collaborations that are forming. So what has happened here is we have a, a, a collaboration between Lewis's uh, laboratory and the Primate Center at Oregon Health Science University. We have the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation of Philanthropy. We have Jeff Lifson, our collaborator at Frederick National Lab, and Gilead, a biotech company, basically coming together to try to answer one very key question. What would happen? What would happen if you now SIV infected these monkeys, you treated them with antiretrovirals, and then you vaccinated, and then you released the antiretroviral therapy, a therapeutic vaccine? What would happen if you had that broad of a response that you saw on the previous slide? Would this actually contribute to basically reducing the reservoir? So this is a, a terrific collaboration. We're very fortunate to be involved in this to address this very, very important question that I think is on everybody's minds in this field right now. So we're very excited to be able to contribute to that. All right, so monoclonal antibodies. This is another very hot topic. Um, so for, for many years, we had just a handful of monoclonal antibodies that were broadly neutralizing. They were of poor potency. But recently, there's been a lot of activity in this area. And I'll highlight a few of these. So, uh, this is uh, an antibody that was discovered by Mark Connors at uh, the NIH. Uh, it's called TENI8. It basically binds the membrane proximal ectodomain of, of GP41. This is GP41, GP120. Very broadly uh, neutralizing 98% of all virus isolates. There have been other antibodies isolated by uh, a consortium that was led by Dennis Burton, IAVI, Theraclone, uh, monogram, and they've identified the PGT series, for example, which binds the V3 glycan over here, and some also be very beautiful work at the Vaccine Research Center of the NIH. They have found CD4 binding site antibodies that bind over here. So 
this new crop of antibodies, uh, highly broadly neutralizing or highly potent, sometimes both, have led to this question. So if you have these powerful tools, and if you had now the, abil the ability to uh, reverse latency, either with a, a pharmacologic intervention, antigenic stimulation, homeostatic proliferation, whatever, and you have the ability to now induce GP120 on the surface of latently infected cells, could these now be recognized by these potent monoclonal antibodies, which could latch on to 120, and now, via some of these effector mechanisms, either ADCC or phagocytosis or complement deposition, could you now lead to lysis of these reservoir cells? So a very important question on our minds, and I think on a lot of people's minds. And to, to maybe provide some evidence that might, this might be occurring, is, this is coming from the work of Dan Baruch, who recently published his work in Nature. And what he did here is he basically took some viremic monkeys, and these are infected with a chimeric, a SHIV virus, because these viruses carry the HIV envelope, since these are HIV envelope-directed monoclonal antibodies. So what, what Dan did, and, and he made this very important discovery, and this is also in collaboration with Dennis Burton, who identified uh, this PGT-121 antibody. So taking viremic animals, giving them one or at most two doses of, of this antibody, PGT-121, you get this very profound and quick viral suppression in monkeys. Now the monkeys eventually rebound when the antibody basically disappears from the circulation of these animals. And so, so there is a transient effect in these, in these monkeys, but not all monkeys. This is the negative control just to show you that these, uh, this virus uh, cannot just be inhibited by any antibody. It has to be inhibited by a broadly neutralizing antibody. So this is now looking at the animals. Uh, this is all the animals that receive PGT-121 either alone or in combination. And as you can see, this, this effect of spiral suppression, transient, eventual rebound. Well, what was intriguing to us was this group of three animals. So the animals that had the lowest viral load set point, as you can see, after one or two doses of this antibody, they never rebounded. Now, we know from other studies that antiretrovirals don't do this. So there's something unique about, about this antibody that has this ability to cause sustained viral remission. And so this obviously is, is very intriguing and has to be carefully followed up. So what we're asking here is whether clearance of virus produ producing cells via man or monoclonal antibody effector mechanism may have occurred. And that goes back to my prior slide. Is there a mechanism that might be clearing these, these virally infected cells? So the question now is obvious, right? If, if this happened, what if we basically reduced viral loads with antiretroviral therapy, pharmacologically drop these levels to, to lower, obviously, the, the higher levels, you don't get this sustained effect, you get a transient effect. But if you combine the antibody with antiretroviral therapy, could you arrive now at a more broad sustained viral remission if you stop the antiretroviral therapy? So this is a very important question. We're again trying to build a, a collaboration. We're very excited about this, and we need to, uh, to basically uh, see if we can pull this off. Very quickly to tell you about, uh, about bispecific antibodies, this is a bit of a strategy that is borrowed from the oncology field using antibodies that uh, basically interact with HIV envelope uh, over here and basically recruit CD3 or activate CD3 uh, on CD8 cells. And this is basically a bit of a different approach to, to, to the standard approach. And basically now I'd like to take you home with uh, the toll-like receptor agonist story that we have uh, been working on. So toll-like receptors, you probably know this well, are small molecule uh, mimics basically of single-stranded RNA that basically lead to the induction of, of interferons. At Gilead, we've identified a molecule called GS9620, which is in clinical development. It's a small molecule TLR7 agonist. It's highly specific. It's administered orally. It's a low dose. It's completed phase one studies, and we're now considering it for, or testing it in HPV-infected patients. In the characterization of this, uh, of this molecule, we discovered these properties, that these TLR7 agonists activate CD8 cells, and this is specifically from HIV-infected subjects on CART and activate NK cells. The CD8 bit, you understand the connection. Obviously, therapeutic vaccines, could this now modulate, enhance the efficacy of therapeutic vaccines? In the case of the NK cells, of course, it's the connection to the monoclonal antibody via ADCC. So these data are confirmed in phase one trials. And so this is the monkey study that we are now conducting, combining romadepsin with a TLR7 agonist. Romadepsin, I told you, the robust kick agent will induce SIV, and this is confirmed in SIV-infected cells as well. This drug does work to induce, provides antigen. The TLR7 agonist activates the dendritic cell, which will in turn will activate the CD8 and NK cells, and we hope that this will now lead to the elimination of uh, infected cells. 
So I'll, I'll finish with uh, the acknowledgement slide. Uh, obviously, we work with a great team at Gilead. I specifically want to mention Derek Sloan, Tomas Salar, and Joe Hesselgesser, my very, very close colleagues on this, on this project. Uh, we have great collaborators at University of Pittsburgh, John Mellers, Deb McMahon, Beth Fine. Uh, ACTG and Celgene are also working uh, closely with us on the clinical trial, A5315. Uh, this is the most important, I think. This is, uh, this is where we get all of our Luco packs, basically, from Quest Clinical, Jay Lazar's clinic. And importantly, I view these, the patients at the clinic as our very close collaborators because without them, we can't make these types of discoveries. Uh, Dan Baruch, James Whitney on the antibody front, Dennis Burton on the antibody, Lewis Picker, and Jeff Lifson on the vaccine front. I'll stop here and take questions. Yeah, I was just curious if you guys have given any thought to another, adding another dimension to you know, the combinatorial therapy you're going for, but to stop proliferative renewal of the memory population, because we know there is some turnover of the latently infected memory population. So proliferative, proliferative renewal. So are you thinking of basically, elaborate on that, because there's a couple of different ways you can interpret that. You're thinking stopping uh, residual production of, of virus by cells, for example, using TAD inhibitors or blocking homeostatic proliferation of memory cells, which... I guess I'm just starting thinking in general, just stopping during the course of treatment, stopping the proliferation of those latently infected memory T cells. I understand this would stop all proliferation of memory T cells, but just as a means of, again, stop putting the brakes on the virus while you continue so your that, therapy. So that, the key is that, that you can't separate those two, right? The proliferating T cell is, 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 the, host of the, virally, is the, the host of the virus. So if you can't selectively stop virally infected cells, you would have to stop homeostatic proliferation of central memory T cells, which is a tricky thing to do. You may choke IL-7, uh, but you'll have a more global effect. So remember, the key is safety as well for us. We need to do things, interventions that are going to be safe. So I, I see your point. Theoretically, that makes sense. You, you constrain the reservoir by preventing its, its expansion, but how do you do that safely and selectively? I don't know how to do that other than choking IL-7, but I don't want to do that, so. You're in charge. Hi, thank you, that was a great talk. Um, I was wondering about the HDAC inhibitors. Are you worried that that could um, start inappropriate gene expression of other genes in the host? That's a, a great, great question. Uh, herpes viruses, endogenous retroviruses, right? Things like that, other genes. Those, those, that's a very good question. It's, it's very much on our minds. It's, uh, I can tell you a lot of people are working on that question right now. Um, what I can tell you is from the clinical studies that we have already, uh, not we, but other companies have conducted, we haven't seen any uh, deleterious effects so far with regard to uh, misregulated genes, for example. Now remember, these are small molecules, and they basically engage the enzyme temporarily, or sometimes a little bit longer, but it's a temporary uh, gene perturbation, if you will. You're not basically shutting down that enzyme permanently. You're going in with pulsing this ant. So, so you're basically perturbing a natural balance of histone acetylases and deacetylases, right? They're going back and forth all the time in your cells as a natural process. So what you're doing is you're temporarily blocking one enzyme, kicking the process into gene expression, but it's a temporary phenomenon. You're not basically locking that enzyme down permanently. So um, that would be my best explanation that I think so far the clinical data says we're not seeing any deleterious effects and the mechanism of action suggests that you probably should be okay. But uh, very important questions and they are being addressed experimentally. Okay. Thank you. Reading from a deep doc. Uh, I have a question regarding HDAC as well, just to follow up. I mean, you have to, oh, I was wondering just when you had HDAC, do you think you completely reactivate every cell that is infected? Because that's what you're shooting for. Or do you still will have a, you know, you're just pushing a reservoir again and continuing and, you know, keeping doing that? Thanks for that question. That's a, that's a very important question. And uh, the answer is no, you activate only a very small proportion of the reservoir. In fact, the work of John Mellor's recently published in PNAS suggests it's about 0.1%. Mitogen's activate about 1%. So we are way, way down on the scale. Um, and I often use this analogy. We're looking for our AZT moment in this field. 
remember antiretrovirals, we would not have what we have today if it wasn't for the initial discovery that AZT works to suppress or block reverse transcription in people. That led to what we now know as single tablet regimens in combination antiretroviral therapy. Romadepsin, I, if, if the Bionor study that I mentioned today uh, in that press release, if, if it's solid and if they showed blips, this could be our moment, that you have the tools in the lab, you have means to find drugs, agents, you have that have, and, and they're predictive, that you might be able to put them into people and say, well, I have now a path from lab to clinic. Now, this sounds trivial, but when you're in the jungle, in the dark ages, you have no clue what assays it, it, this is a lot, so, so I'm crossing my fingers, and I'm hoping that, that those plasma blips that that, that group in, in Norway and in Denmark showed are real, and if they are real, we, we have the beginnings of something. We have the ability to basically identify agents that reactivate latent HIV in human beings safely, and that provides the paradigm, so. There's two. Okay, so. So my question is regarding using the MCV as a vector for vaccine because according to my understanding, there are some percentage of population already infected with MCV and asymptomatically. So can you comment on that um, effect? That's, that's a great question. And obviously in these short presentations, you don't have time to discuss all the details. The monkeys that were vaccinated are CMV positive. So first and foremost, the vaccine works to super infect monkeys, and we assume people as well who are already seropositive. So you don't have to de novo infect people. These will be vaccines that are given to people who are already CMV positive. So I think that's one very important criteria. Um, in terms of, of, of other aspects, um, Obviously, if you're already CMV positive, you uh, have already mounted an immune response, you clearly are able to control this virus. This would be a super infection. Hard to say what the effects will be, but obviously it's a good start that, you know, there's a good chance it might be safe there. Uh, the regulatory path, though, is complicated. I mean, this is a virus that you, as a vaccine, you will be giving to folks and you can't remove it once you've given it. So uh, there are some challenges here. But what you saw in that monkey study is without precedent. Nobody has ever been able to, as folks, uh, uh, Paul is here, Paul is here, Paul Lusu, who has been a pioneer in this area, knows about this more than anyone. He knows full well that uh, there's no vaccine in the history of the last 30 years that you have been working on this, Paul, that has ever shown any type of protection that we see here. It's only 50%, we understand that, but it's still 50%. And if you dig into those monkeys three years later, there's no virus to be found. So this is without precedent. So for us, we view this as a blueprint. This might be feasible. You might have, something might be working here. Now a lot of work is needed, but I think this says that we might have a chance. Whereas before this study, we, we said the immune system can't control these viruses. So last question. Um, my question is about the TLR7 study that you showed. So you're focusing on the, using the PDC to, to do your dirty work with the, with the, or with the adaptive immune system. But, PDCs, they're hit very early along with CD4 cells, and they don't actually recover to pre-infection levels, and neither does their function. But then the flip side to that is, if you can get them to activate, are you worried about having overactivation PDCs because they're a very prolific, you know, innate immune, you know, inflammatory modulator? I mean, again, very good questions, uh, very insightful. Uh, so, I mean, the good news here is that we've already dosed these agents, or at least one of these agents, 9620 in humans that uh, are HCV infected, normal volunteers, HPV. So there's not any uncontrolled effects that we have seen. You know, you see, and again, we're dosing at very low levels. We're trying to stay away from the induction of peripheral interferon levels. We're trying to dose to levels that only induce ISGs to keep things on the safe side. Uh, agent is well tolerated, has, has done well. Uh, so we know, at least from human dosing, which should be the gold standard, there, there's not, nothing uh, deleterious that has happened thus far in these early clinical trials. So uh, I, I guess tweaking or modulating that aspect of the immune system with a small molecule, again, a mimic of single-stranded RNA, temporarily seems to be safe. Uh, it induces interferon, uh, at least ISGs, and activates CD8 cells, activates NK cells. So we saw all the things that we had seen in vitro in these human subjects and they have done well, so, so I, I think it's safe so far. 